Okay, we're recording. This is the opening and closing meetings webinar. And today's date is Thursday, May 14th, 2020. I'm Rob Packard from Medical Device Academy. And this is going to be, um, it's on a very narrow topic, opening and closing meeting. And normally in the past, I wouldn't have said, you know, you really don't need a whole entire webinar just on opening and closing meetings. But now that we're starting to do a lot more remote auditing of clients and we do things a little bit differently for remote uh, audits. I thought it would be useful to have a series of webinars that talk about what things you do differently for, for a remote audit. And I thought the best place to start was the opening and closing meeting. Um, so I created this presentation slide deck and when people signed up, they also could ask questions. So we actually have quite a few questions that go beyond just the scope of opening and closing meeting, but we also cover some really great questions about uh, remote auditing as well. And Matthew Walker is on the call as well. He and I are actually doing a remote audit. We have our closing meeting this afternoon. So Matthew, take notes because you're gonna be acting lead auditor and doing the closing meeting. So no excuses, you've just gone through your training. Okay, so the slide on the left-hand side of my screen is the opening meeting checklist. If you were gonna do a live uh, onsite opening meeting, you could just have that in front of you. If you were doing it by teleconference, you could just have a copy of that in front of you and check off the items as you go through it. Um, same thing on the closing meeting, we, that's on the right. And so the big question is, what do you do differently for a remote audit? So let's start out with the fears of why we don't do remote audits all the time, because who really wants to get in their car and drive really long distances, stay overnight at the, uh, Hilton Garden and and fly on airplanes all the time. Um, I, you know, maybe we really like eating at Red Lobster and on somebody else's dime, but there's got to be another reason why we don't do nothing but remote audits. And here are the four reasons I came up with, and I'm sure our audience has some other suggestions as to why this doesn't happen more. But really, one of the big concerns of a notified body auditor or a certification body auditor is, and, and the FDA as well, Auditees will hide things from us. So if you're the auditee and you're going through a remote audit, one of the biggest things you wanna emphasize or at least give the auditor a perception of is that you don't have anything to hide. That's a problem for face-to-face -face audits as well. So the FDA, if they get the impression that you're trying to hide something, they're gonna to be tougher on you and they're gonna ask a lot tougher questions and do more follow-up and sample records. Um, and they're probably gonna be a little bit more abrasive personality-wise. Uh, whereas if you give them the impression and, the, and your personality shows that, you know, we're here to learn, we wanna do things right, let us know if you see any problems, and you share with them as quickly as you can the, the documents and records they asked for, that's gonna give them a good impression. So that's one of the things you should do. And when you're doing a remote audit, if you're walking around with a selfie stick and showing people video, live video of the area rather than a recording, that should give them some level of confidence. But you could ask when you're in an area, um, is there anything else you would like to see while we're here? Because if you're live in person, you just move your head around and you can see. But when you're doing a remote audit and you're using a video camera, you rely on the guide that's carrying the selfie stick in the camera to pan it around the area and show you the area. So you should slowly pan around, not really fast to make them sick to their stomach, but slowly pan the area, say this is the area, point out specific things, maybe have somebody in the field, the view, pointing to things. So you say, could you point at that piece of equipment? And the person points to it. So even if they don't speak the language well, and there's an interpreter involved and everything's slow and, and the communication's poor, people understand pointing. And so a video with pointing really works well and saying hi and showing them that you're smiling. They can see, you know, every once in a while, uh, smiling, showing somebody's face, showing a piece of equipment, showing where things come from. Um, that, that really helps. And uh, so that's one of the ways to overcome that issue. Another thing is it's going to take a really long time and be difficult to uh, review the records, especially if it's paper-based. So they have to scan the records. Um, how are they gonna communicate those records? Um, the audit that we're doing, the auditee is holding the records up to the screen. So, um, you know, like 
if you um, are doing, um, you know, you have a document and you hold it up like that in front of the screen. That's one of the things that we've been doing and you hold it, try to hold it steady. Um, you might even consider having a little, um, if you had um, a, a stand like we do for music sheets, if you're uh, a, a musician and you're trying to play an instrument, you usually have a stand for your music sheets. If you have some sort of a folder uh, or some sort of stand that you can put your documents on and then reorient the camera so it's pointing at that document, then you don't have to worry about holding it super steady and you can see the display on your screen as well. And you can see if you have it in focus, if you're, if you're showing the right part of the document. And so that might help you. So that might be something you want to invest in is get a little stand for holding documents so you can display them. Um, I also have two different stands for holding um, cameras. So this particular one that I'm using now um, puts it right in front of my face, whereas the one that I had before was more off to the side. Uh, so you get more of a profile view of me. Sometimes you want one view versus another. Um, another thing that we've done is I've got high definition cameras. So I've got a 1080p camera uh, from Logitech. So you definitely want to invest in a high end camera that gives you high definition if you're going to show somebody a document and you expect them to be able to read it. Um, you you want to get used to that and practice it a little bit maybe for maybe you could do a manager review and conduct it remotely for some of the attendees or maybe in audit preparation you're going through some of the documents um, ahead of time another thing on the list was connection will be lost in the middle of the audit yes sometimes we lose connections so the best way to handle that is what is your backup plan number one try to reconnect so don't panic we'll try to reconnect there might be a little delay the auditor shouldn't be stressed out because that gives them time to write audit notes they're always catching up on notes anyway so if you've given them some procedures to review they can work on the procedure until the connections reestablished um, and you should have a backup plan so it's great to have your your phone handy and be able to um, use Slack as a communication tool or Messenger or some other uh, texting message to automatically communicate back and forth or to actually pick up the phone and call the person. Um, if they're in another country, you might be using what uh, applications such as WhatsApp. Uh, there's another one very similar to that that's uh, preferred in China because it's controlled by the government, um, whereas WhatsApp is not uh, controlled by the government. Uh, there are a couple other things that we use, um, um, like my kids every night, I use Snapchat. So you could even do Snapchat calls uh, just to quickly communicate things to people in a pinch. So if you're almost done and you have 10 more minutes and you lost your connection, here are some solutions that you should be thinking about ahead of time. And the last one is, is um, one of the people asked, like, you know, what, what software do you recommend for eight hours of um, auditing on the computer? But... Um, it's going to be exhausting to sit in front of the computer for eight hours. You have to go to the bathroom. I just finished an hour and a half. Or it was more like an hour and 50 minutes with Matthew working on uh, a remote audit. And he did a section. I did a section. That's why we ran a little bit over. We tried to compress both sessions into one instead of uh, doing an afternoon session. Instead, we're going to have the closing meeting a little bit earlier than planned and finish the audit earlier. But um, in order to sit, for eight hours, you, you would have to be some sort of superhuman. You, you need to eat, you need to go to the bathroom, you need uh, a little bit of water every once in a while. That's something you need to function. Um, I, I joke about it in, in the introduction to our book, you know, like you, you don't wanna be getting deep vein thrombosis from sitting all day. Um, and it's not really a joke and matter. I, I noticed myself because my job is sitting all day long in front of the computer, it wears on your body. Your, your posture is screwed up, your back hurts, your, your legs lose, um, lose all kinds of um, circulation and it, you get things like restless leg syndrome that can be caused by that. So this is a concern, don't even attempt to work for eight hours straight in front of the computer. People don't want to talk for eight hours straight in front of the computer and it's not productive. You're much better off doing shorter segments. I don't know what the ideal segment is. Um, I'm not even sure there is an ideal because it depends on what you're trying to do in what area you're auditing. But an hour and a half is probably the outside limit of what you wanna try for a continuous uh, stretch without breaks. 
And if you can do 45 minutes, that's great. I think a half hour is a little short, but if you only have half hour time, you take it. Um, auditors are always forced to make do with the time that they have available. And that's always a challenge for every auditor all over the world. But um, I like 45 minute sessions, particularly for an, an area that's small in, in, in a scope and it's gonna be fairly straightforward and easy to audit and areas that are more complicated and important, uh, higher risk areas like production process controls, this should be probably an hour and a half. But you can cover just about any area you want in an hour and a half. Um, so think in terms of small chunks and scheduling them rather than continuous spans like we're used to. You're, it means a change in the way we're used to doing things, but it's actually easier to schedule people for hour, hour and a half slots than it is to schedule an eight hour day uh, because then they can't get any other work done. And here are some of the equalizers. So on the left, uh, there is a, uh, it's sort of like a selfie stick, it's, but instead of having a long stick to it, it also has the ability to pan automatically and it has motion uh, control. So it will stabilize the image and allows you to rotate the image simultaneously. Um, it has a, um, I forget what it's called, a, basically a gyroscope in there that makes sure it's always pointed vertically and keeps the image much more stable. So you can actually walk with this in your hand and not have a jerking image. So that's one of the things that you may want to invest in. I have one of these, but they're, they're not cheap. Um, and um, because it's shorter in length, you might want to think about some are long um, and some are short. Uh, the Android phones tend to work better on this type of device and the ones that have the long extension tend to be more friendly for the iPhone. So uh, depending on what device you have, you may choose one brand versus another and they're always changing. Uh, but to give you an idea of how well these work, people can rollerblade on these and use one of these selfie sticks. So you might wanna really consider using that if you're gonna do a lot of remote auditing um, or at least support remote audits and somebody else is auditing you. Uh, the tool on the right, that's exactly what I have on my desk. Mine's a little bit longer, but yes, these flexible gooseneck kind of things that allow you to position the camera right in front of your face, um, which is probably right in front of your computer monitor. And so that's this way I have a gigantic 48-inch uh, flat screen monitor so I can see two documents in big screen in front of me side by side so I can type my audit report. And on the left-hand side, I can have the uh, document I'm um, editing. I can see lots of things in really high definition. Um, it, it's, it's blown up tremendously, so that's a great help. But at the same time, I don't have a camera that's right in front of my face like I do on a laptop. So this solution allows me to have a camera in front of my face for recording video, but at the same time, I have this great viewing screen. So these are some of the tools that somebody that works 100% remote for years, this is what you have to do. Um, so those are tools that you might try. The dis or so we talked about the disadvantages, now the advantages of remote auditing. So these are a little more obvious. Number one, you're no longer required to limit things to an eight hour day. So I can't tell you how many times people have asked me to do a supplier audit in an eight hour day, but we really need nine hours. <laughs> we need 10 hours. Um, or let's say we need a day and a half, but who wants to stay around for an extra day and a half? Or it's a two day audit, but I need two and a half. I, I just need a little bit more or have to catch a plane. All those things go away when you're no longer locking yourself into the logistics of travel. So you don't have to be locked into eight hour days. Instead, figure out what you wanna audit, figure out how much time is needed and don't worry about eight hour days. Um, number two, auditors can discuss and review records offline. So an audit, a remote audit is not you emailing me documents and I review them. That's a desktop audit. A real audit, a remote audit or virtual audit, I have to actually have a conversation with you. I have to interact with you, ask you questions. I need to see your body language. I need to see your eyes. I need to see your face. I need to see documents. I need to walk around the facility virtually. So it's got to be a virtual audit, not a remote desktop kind of thing. Desktop is not the same. I need to talk to the process owner, ask them questions. Gathering information is not just reading a procedure and reading a record. It's also interviewing the auditees. And that's an critical, critical part. Number three, the subject and matter experts can easily participate in a single process instead of the entire audit. So we were just talking yesterday, and I hope Matthew wrote down the phrase because we definitely want to use this again. But basically, um, 
you can't be a subject matter in everything. You can't. You, nobody can be a subject matter expert in every single thing. We can spend 30 years in an area, but at a certain point, you start getting outdated. And you have to acknowledge, you know, I'm, I'm no longer current in that. I need somebody else that is current in that area. So you have to bring in a subject matter expert for that area. Or maybe it's just something you don't ever, that's not even your area. I'm a chemical engineer, not an electrical engineer. I need to go get an electrical engineer to do that part. So um, you may not want to train every single person in your company to be a, an auditor, and they may not all be competent, and you can't afford to put them all on a plane. But you could do an audit on site and have a part of it done remotely by a subject matter expert in that area. And that would be a really great way to get them involved in the process. And they don't have to be qualified as a lead auditor, they can be qualified as a team member and have less training on auditing. And you can coach them ahead of time. So this is what I want you to ask. This is how I want you to ask it. These are the open-ended questions I recommend. Here's what I want you to document. Here's how I want you to document it. You can really do a lot to help somebody that has never done auditing do a very competent job of auditing a process, particularly when they know better than you do, because they don't have to learn anything about the technology. They just need to know what to write down for the audit and what questions to ask. Um, and then the last area, the advantage of a remote audit is you can take rests and breaks in between the processes. They're very easily scheduled. So what Matthew and I are doing is really simple. We took a standard two-day audit and we said, we're going to make it four days. We're going to do an hour and a half in the morning and an hour and a half in the afternoon, same time each day. And that gives us a nice block before in the morning to do work, a block in between the two sessions to do work, and a block afterwards to do work. So we're getting our work done. We're doing audit note taking, audit preparation. We're discussing the audit between each other. And we're having time to do these uh, each of these eight processes that we're auditing, and we're actually auditing a few more than eight, because some don't take a whole hour and a half. And so th it's very easy to have breaks before and after. But the real advantage of having breaks is now your productivity level is much, much higher. You have the energy, you're, you're motivated. Okay, I'm prepared, I'm ready, hour and a half, as fast as I can, I'm going to concentrate on this and do a really great job of this process. Then I take a break. We're done. I go get a drink. I have lunch. I go to the bathroom. I, I review my notes. I update my audit report. Okay, now we're ready for the afternoon session. I maybe even go on a walk. It's a beautiful day outside. So that's something you can't do during an on-site audit for eight hours. And that's one of the reasons why people get burned out. They never take breaks. They never take rests. You talk to a professional notified body auditor, I used to leave on Sunday afternoon and I'd come back Friday night at midnight and I would wake up in the morning. I would have no idea what country I was in, let alone the state or the city. So that happens when you don't get rest. You can't remember things well. Your productivity in these audits and how well and how efficiently you audit will not be there. And you can have that level of performance raised exponentially when you do breaks and rests. So, how long should the closing meetings be? Um, and I don't know why this says closing here. It really should say opening. So the opening and closing meetings, how long should they be? Um, there isn't any required time of how long they should be. But for an opening meeting in general, I try to target a half an hour. It can be done in 15 minutes, but you gotta be very organized and focused. Um, what Matthew and I experienced in our opening meeting this week on Monday was that we had um, a few minutes of the client getting used to using Zoom because they hadn't used it before and setting up their camera. So that's what you're going to find if you haven't done a remote audit with somebody before and they don't live on Zoom like I do. Um, yeah, they're, they're going to need a little bit of adjustment. So you're going to need to add in a few minutes. You can help yourself by maybe having uh, an initial meeting before the audit scheduled to go over the agenda with a person and make sure they have all the equipment they need to do this audit correctly. So that's something you want to definitely think about. Uh, is to have a, a little um, early session, maybe a couple of days or a week beforehand to troubleshoot the uh, logistics of the technology that they're going to be using and they may not have used before. Um, and you can go through that checklist. Don't spend too too long on any one point. The, you, you cover the point, go on to the next one. Keep moving along and try to get through it as quickly as you can. But efficiently, a half hour is what I usually shoot for. Um, here's the checklist. We won't uh, to belabor that. You can review that at your leisure. Um, okay, so remote audit preparation. The lead auditor should be sending out the audit agenda ahead of time. 
they should be sending out invitations for the opening meeting to all the people that it should be sent and then those people can forward it if somebody needs to be added. Um, you want to encourage them to invite senior management in their company. Uh, the FDA in particular and notified bodies like to see top management involved in the opening and closing meetings. It's not required, but it's recommended. And when you're doing, when you have things set up so you can do it remotely, you could have an on-site opening meeting and still invite somebody remotely to participate. So you want to think about that. Um, invitations to every process. So if you're going to break it up as we're suggesting into hour and a half segments or 45 minutes or one hour segments, it sent out separate invitations to each one of those because not everybody in the company that needs to know about the audit needs to be invited to every single process audit. It really only needs to be the process audit, the process owner that you're going to be interviewing, the audit tour that's going to audit them, and maybe a guide or the management representative. That's it. It might only be that list. And if it's if you're doing a team audit, like Matthew and I are, um, if Matthew's auditing an area, then he would invite me as the audit lead, um, uh, lead auditor, and my attendance would be optional. So uh, if he needs me, he could text me, and then I could join the link because I have it. But I might actually be auditing another area and say, time out for a second. I need to disconnect. I need to call in for um, this other audit uh, and see what Matthew needs my help or opinion on and have me look at something. And um, because we have these really cool phones here that we can do just about everything under the sun on, I can actually do Zoom calls right on this device, WebEx, um, GoToMeeting, all of those can be done right on this phone and they've done it before. Um, you could even do Snapchat. So that allows you to participate um, with the person remotely with while you've got another session simultaneously going. So I can have this session going um, for the rem uh, my audit area and simultaneously another auditor can be auditing another area and I can jump from my area to their area briefly on my phone to answer their question and then come back to what I'm doing. And you just turn off, mute your mic and turn off the video for that period of time. Um, next thing, invitations to the closing meeting. So same thing as the opening, send out invitations to everybody on the closing meeting and the audit report. So you as a lead auditor, you're responsible for um, finalizing the audit report, even though everybody contributes to it, you finalize the report and then distribute it to the client. But when you're creating that audit report, I recommend using a template. And I'm gonna re recommend something a little differently than we do for um, on-site meetings. I recommend for a remote audit, you use Google Docs. And the reason why I recommend Google Docs is because myself and a team member can simultaneously be writing on the same document at the same time without getting any conflicts. If I do that with Word, I get conflicts created. Um, so you, you really need a software tool that allows you to both write on it at the exact same time. Also, I was, Earlier today, I was writing something on there and Matthew made a note for me. Hey, I still have some notes to copy in there. And I said, okay. So we left it highlighted. And so he knew, okay, this is where he had to insert his notes. So you can communicate with some one another. You can tell the other person, hey, I'm still making edits there. Um, you can remind them, hey, I have an audit trail for you to follow up. These are the things you can do. Um, you also want to make sure you have a slide in your presentation for an opening and closing meeting saying, hey, Here's, um, here's my face, here's what I look like, because you're not physically there, and you also give them your contact information, the email, the mobile phone, and maybe that backup communication when everything falls apart. So make sure you introduce yourself and give that information to everybody in your uh, slide deck. Slide, uh, sign in sheets, they're not required for opening meetings. Um, if you're doing an internal audit, which would be a first party audit, or a supplier audit if it's a second party audit. And first party audit and second party audits can be done by consultants, which are technically third parties, but we don't call it a first party audit or a second party audit. That terminology comes from the ISO uh, 19011 um, standard. It actually says what first, second and third party audits are. So an FDA inspection is a third party audit. A certification body recertification audits, those are third party audits. So those are very formal, and because they're third party, they require a sign-in sheet. Um, from the FDA, you're gonna get something signed by them, an FDA Form 482 saying they're authorized to come do this FDA inspection. And then at the end, if assuming you have a nonconformity, you'd have an FDA 483 that you would make annotations on. 
Um, so those are the kinds of uh, formal things that we see with an opening sign-in sheet. Some companies have their own opening sign-in sheet forms that they want you to fill out, and they can certainly send that to the lead auditor that's working things remotely, and they can sign in and send it back. So that's something we can still do the sign-in sheets, but it's not required for first and second party audits. So if your procedure has it, it's not something you have to have, so you can eliminate it if you want. Uh, what we have is actually in our audit report template, we actually just have a table saying, here's the names, and if we add, to add a name, we just add a row and add the name. And we indicate whether they were there for the opening and the closing or both. Um, you wanna obtain business cards. So even though um, this is just an audit, normally we, if we were face-to-face, -face, we would hand out business cards. It's a great idea to send the person an email with your, what a lot of people have is V cards from Outlook. Um, you might have uh, some other kind of uh, communication where you're gonna share contact information and background, such as a LinkedIn invitation. So connect with people on LinkedIn. Um, all of us are trying to increase our, our social media connections um, out there for networking whenever we need help with something or we're looking for a new job. And so, hey, share your LinkedIn profiles with people uh, that you're gonna be auditing. Um, never know when you might be able to help them or they might be able to help you. And if you're going to, um, when you record the session, um, if you record the session, you, you can also make that available to other people. That's a really great idea. And during the session, you might actually say, you know, here's who the different people are. You can share that ahead of time. Uh, but there are different things that you can do to share. Uh, here's who's in attendance. Um, ideally, like if you if you shared a, um, if you're gonna have a sign-in form, you could share that as a Google Doc, share that with the other company, and then everybody in the room could simultaneously, or everybody that's in the virtual room, could simultaneously be typing in their name and address all at once instead of handing around a piece of paper that has to go all the way around the room. So when you use virtual technology, you can actually do things faster because people can simultaneously be editing the same exact document. Um, normally, one of the things that's on the checklist is asking the team members to take notes. So the lead auditor is talking, but you might have somebody else taking notes. So, oh, could you please make a note of that? Um, so that's something you do. And so Matthew is the audit team member on the audit we're doing this week. I have his email here. I provided his photo, but I could share with the audit team like, oh, could you please send that to Matthew? Um, oh, could you, when you fill out this sign sheet, we'll email it to you. Could you please send it back to us? So those are things you can do. Um, the person should make a note when it started, if it started on time, if there were any problems. So next year when we come back, we can avoid some of those same mistakes. We keep that information in our notes. The most important thing is, are there any changes to the agenda? So if the team member has the agenda in front of them and they're sharing that with everybody through Google Drive, we can make edits real time to the agenda and everybody sees it simultaneously. And he can make notes also in the audit report about what changes we made to the agenda while I'm still talking. So this is, we're getting, we can uh, simultaneously uh, multitask on this as a team. Uh, so I can focus on the presentation and he can focus on the notes to the agenda and the report. And then ask the audit team to introduce themselves. So uh, we might switch from my video screen to Matthew's video screen. He says, hi, she waves his hand. Um, and so that might be the only time they meet somebody when you're doing remote audits. Uh, but it, it's a really good idea to introduce yourself and show your face and get people feeling a little bit more comfortable with this virtual environment. This is extremely important. We were we always required to confirm the objective. So if you're doing a supplier audit, the objective is to verify that the supplier has a suitable quality system for manufacturing our product. The scope of the audit is the location or the process area. So it's not the clauses, it's the physical location or the process area that you're auditing. That is the scope. The standards are, the, um, are something that we audit to, the regulations are something we audit to. Those are called the audit criteria, but you wanna list the different standards in the audit report and the regulations in the audit report. So if you're doing Health Canada, you're doing an MDSAP audit, you're gonna say, well, we're gonna look at the Canadian Medical Device Regulations Part 1, or if it's an IVD product, it's gonna be Part 2. Um, so those are important things that you need to know and they have to be documented in your audit agenda and in the audit report.
and you should review them and make sure they're covered because you never know when the client says, oh yeah, we started selling in Brazil. Oh, well, we're doing an MBSAP audit, so we need to make sure that we cover Brazil in the scope. Any adjustments to the agenda? We already talked about this, but um, make sure that all the owners um, are of the processes that you're gonna be interviewing are correctly identified if somebody isn't available. Make sure you swap out the names in there. That's really important. Make sure everybody's available at the time plan. This week we had no changes that were made. That never happens in an audit. It's the same client we visit year after year. We do these audits. I've done them, Mary Vodder's done them, Matthew's done them. We've never not had a change in our audit schedule. We do a remote audit, nothing changed. Everything was on schedule. It's crazy. Like I thought we would have more troubles. We're having fewer troubles doing this remotely. Um, so it's actually working better to do a remote audit of this client than it is on site. And it's a small company that's nearby us. So we shouldn't have any problems, but it's actually working better. So, but if you have tr troubles, if you have any change of plans, put them in your audit agenda and update the report to reflect that. Um, last but not least, you're supposed to explain the purpose of guides. So um, this person that was uh, taking us around, his name's Dave, he carries the selfie stick. So that's one of the purposes of the guides. You should tell them, you know, I need whoever is gonna be best with a selfie stick and knows how to control that, and knows the different options, and is comfortable with this technology. You really need to be the person walking around with us. Um, so you might have that be a different person than normal because they might be technologically savvy and, and really know how to use that app very, very well. Um, or it might be their cell phone <laughs> that we're gonna use. So those are important things to consider is like the guide that you might use for a remote audit or virtual audit might be different from the guide that you would normally use because you want them to be the person that can handle this technology and move it around and can work a selfie stick. And it's gonna be their phone that's gonna be used for this. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, uh, documentation used in notes. Um, so you might wanna talk in the opening meeting about, um, you're always supposed to say, you know, what documentation we're going to use and how we're going to use it. We take notes. So we tell them, you know, if you see the auditor writing furiously, that's a good thing because we're writing conformity. If you have us asking the same question over and over again in a different wording without taking any notes, that's a bad thing because we're struggling to identify how you're conforming. So that's something to keep in mind. But when you're doing things remotely, and if you're not sharing your screen here, they can't tell that I'm writing. They can't tell that I'm typing unless I bang along on the keyboard. So one of the things to talk about is if you hear me being silent, um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It might mean I'm just recording my notes um, or looking back at a procedure or looking back at the standard and they can't see you like they could in a normal audit or they can't see everything because it only shows your face, not your keyboard. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, they also can't see what screen you're flipping from and to. Um, but we're gonna, anything that can, anything that you gather during the audit can be used as records in the audit report. So documents they give you, procedures, records, verbal statements, because you're doing a real audit, not just a desktop audit. And those can all be collected as objective evidence. Video can be used as objective evidence because it's what you're seeing. The big question is whether it can be recorded or not, whether they will allow you to record it. So that's a big question. Um, some suppliers, when we do a supplier audit, they won't let us record things. But if they're controlling it and we've agreed we won't record it, um, they could show us a video of things so we can take notes and really do a quality audit. Um, but we just need to make sure we have those non-disclosures agreements in place and agree we're not gonna record it. Um, you always have to tell people it's just a sampling. Um, and that's in particularly important in this case because there are only so many things that you can show me that are paper records that you can put on the screen or scan and send to me. I can't see everything because I can't turn my head 360 degrees. Uh, there are some areas that you might not be able to access. You might have some areas where you don't have cell phone signal or internet signal. Uh, you might have some interruptions. So you might have some people that are having difficulty with the technology. So those are all things that could reduce the uh, effectiveness of your audit. And you wanna make notes about those in your audit report, but audits are still just a sampling. So just because we find something doesn't mean your system's broken. If we don't find anything, that doesn't mean everything is perfect and you don't need to continue doing internal audits. Uh, it just means we didn't find anything in this audit. 
Okay, team meetings and client communication. This is um, something that actually worked better in the remote, I think, than it does work in person. A lot of times when you have a team audit, you have one person in one area, one person in another area. With the uh, remote auditing, we can share the audit report and simultaneously be typing into it and share notes with one another. We can use Slack, we can use Messenger, we can text the person, we can call the person. So the team communication seems to be improved. Uh, communication with a client, I'm, I'm not so sure. I didn't see it being worse. Uh, I would say it's about the same with the communication with the client, but I think because you have the ability for people to attend these meetings virtually, you might get more likely to get more attendees uh, for opening and closing meetings. So something to keep in mind. Uh, but you should always communicate with the client and whoever the management representative is, hey, we found a potential nonconformity. Do you need more time to gather evidence? So maybe there, this isn't a nonconformity, we just don't have the evidence yet. So make sure you communicate with them and if you don't have everybody on the call at that time, that's something that's important. So um, give yourself in time in between different areas to do a little bit of follow-up to make sure you get all the evidence you needed before you say, yes, this is a nonconformity. And if it is, you wanna make sure you communicate it, no matter whether it's virtual or face-to-face. Uh, confirm confidentiality. So this is where we asked at the beginning of this audit, hey, do we have an NDA? Because I didn't have a current signed one with this client. We've had been working with them for years, but it's out of date. So that's another thing to remind clients of. Um, the confidential details, if there's anything you want us to omit from the report, you can always say, I uh, looked at this record number, this document number, and leave some of the confidential details out, anonymize it. So you they can, if they can find the record number, they can go back and reproduce the audit, but they may not have the confidential details. That's important to discuss what things are confidential and what things aren't, particularly when you're doing supplier audits where a supplier uh, satisfies multiple or has multiple customers that might be competitors. Um, also, if there is something that shows up in a recording that is not appropriate, we have this modern technology of the ability to edit videos so you can easily clip things out, but you can also blur them out for specific segments of the video uh, screen. So all of that we have had to do at one time or another for videos. Okay, safety procedures. Um, not really applicable to remote audits, so we don't have to worry about getting hurt. So that's a great thing. Um, but if you have part of your team working on site, if they have any PPE requirements, that's something you should be asking now is, do we need to wear a face mask? And uh, any emergency procedures is something you should be asking anyway on all audits and safety precautions. So anybody walking around the facility, uh, what if we have a fire drill? What if we have a fire alarm? What should I expect here? Do we need to wear safety shoes, safety glasses? Those are the things you normally discuss in an opening meeting, but in this uh, virtual world, there's not much chance of injury. So the safety procedures kind of goes away. And method of report, uh, reporting and grading. So all our reports are written. If it's not documented, it's a rumor. The reports are gonna be provided to whoever the customer is or client is. So sometimes when we do supplier audits to verify whether they're gonna be a suitable supplier or not and qualify them, we may choose to not give the supplier the report because we might have things in there like this supplier is not okay, they're not as good as the other company that we visited. So you might have some comparative statements in there um, and things you don't wanna share with the supplier. So not all things from a supplier audit report should be shared with the supplier if you're qualifying that supplier. So that's something to keep in mind and discuss with your audit team beforehand. Um, but if you're going to share the report with them, then you tell them that in the opening meeting. Um, will the notes be included or not? Uh, for In our case, we're incorporating our notes into the language of the report. Uh, there may be separate notes, but they're only gonna get the report. Uh, so any notes that we feel are needed, we put them in the report. But sometimes I've, in the past, I've just included, here's all my notes. So here's 25 pages of notes, here you go, typed. Uh, so. People actually prefer that sometimes because they don't want everything shared with a notified by the auditor uh, from their internal audit. There might have been discussions on how they could fix things that they want left out. So that little bit of consulting, that might be in the notes. 
um, the grading of findings. So typically, traditionally, we would have major findings, minor findings, and opportunities for improvement, or OFIs. However, the notified bodies and certification bodies under the MD-SAP program and GHTF guidance, they've switched to a numbered system where you get points, and it could be up to six points issued, but the scoring system goes from one to five, five being a serious uh, major nonconformity, but they don't call them majors. They just call it a score of a five. So um, you could simulate that system, but it's not required. It's only required for MD-SAP audits. I'm not particularly in favor of it. I think uh, people have enough trouble with majors and minors. I don't think we need to add the complexity of that, but that's how the notified bodies are doing it. So if you want to simulate that, then you should use that system. Um, critical findings tend to be something that is going to potentially result in a warning letter or an FDA 43 um, is not so likely. It's really the critical findings should be things that are warning letter level of importance uh, or something that could suspend your certificate. So companies uh, tend to be have specific grading of critical I don't see it very often, but I do see companies that highlight these critical findings where it, it's not just a it's not just a major, but it's something we need to immediately address because it could disrupt our business. Um, and then we have observations. It's I don't have enough information. Same thing with OFIs. I don't have enough information to identify this as a nonconformity, but it's something that could become a nonconformity in the future. Or an observation could be this record wasn't available, so we couldn't say whether it was a finding or not. Uh, needs to be a follow up in a future audit. So those aren't really OFIs, those are true observations. So that's the different types of grades that you might discuss. If people are looking for what a major and a minor is, I usually make it very simple. I say, there are three ways you get a major. Number one, you ship product knowingly that's nonconformity. That's illegal, um, so don't do that. Number two, you have a minor nonconformity you did nothing about. You absolutely did nothing on it, we escalate that to a major. Third is you have a complete absence of a quality system requirement. So we don't do document control. Okay, there's a major nonconformity. We don't do calibration. We don't do internal audits. If you don't have a procedure for it and you didn't do it, then it's a major. If you have a procedure but skipped it, that's a minor. So anything else is a minor. So to get a major, you don't think you have a major. You either know you have a major or it's not a major, it's a minor. So minor covers everything else, but those three things will get you majors. Appeals and disputes, just checking on my time here. Um, companies that have appeals, uh, when, you, when an auditor gives you a finding, you don't necessarily always agree with them. So you try to resolve that during the audit. You try to provide, provide them with records and convince them that, no, this isn't a nonconformity. It might be because they didn't have the right information. You might even persuade them in the, in the closing meeting. But if there is a, a dispute over a finding, there should be a process for how to address that. When I do supplier audits and in, in internal audits, what I say to clients is, as long as it's factual, I don't mind changing the grading of something because the consequence is all on them, not on me. If they feel it should be graded higher so they can get more management um, uh, focus on it, I'm happy to grade it higher, uh, grade it more harshly than I think it needs to be to get more attention as long as it's factual. And then if they want to downgrade it so it doesn't get the level of management uh, uh, focus on it, that's okay too, as long as it's still factual. But the grading of it in the report could be could affect your outcome when you have a notified body or certification body look at how you're grading things in internal audits. So you don't want them to give you a nonconformity for soft grading of findings. So something to think about, but you should always know what the appeals process and certification bodies should always tell you what the appeals process is in the opening or closing meeting of an audit. Uh, meals and bathroom breaks, one of the big things in on-site audits, you're always talking about where's the lunch menu? Not a discussion. Um, you could, if you want to get to know the people that you're auditing more, you could actually have like a conference call where we're not auditing now, we're just having lunch. And you could chat casually like you normally would in a, an on-site audit, but everybody has different food that they ordered themselves or made in their kitchen. So those are options. Uh, but you don't have to have meals to worry about whether you're going to get food that you're allergic to uh, or that you like when you have to do on-site audit. I mean, when you're doing virtual audits. Bathroom breaks, just remember to... Uh, pause your video and mute your microphone. 
uh, particularly if you're on your cell phone that you might carry with you. And it's really not an issue with semi-continuous audits. And then team member comments. Uh, hey, Matthew, do you have any other comments here regarding opening meetings uh, or regarding the audit in general? Are there any questions for the audience? And make sure you give them time for questions. Okay, now we're gonna get into the closing meetings. So how long should the closing meetings be? Closing meetings, um, I, I used to audit when I, it was actually the, the final qualifying audit for me to be a lead auditor. The, the person that was uh, reviewing me, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, they actually said, you know, you, you gotta make sure that you parked out in the parking lot with your, the, with your uh, you backed into the parking space so you can make a quick getaway because we wanna get out of here quickly. Uh, particularly after we give the client the major. And they were joking. Uh, the client didn't get any majors. It was a certification audit and it went very, very well. But their point was, to me was, you better not drag this closing meeting out forever. We want this to be short and sweet and get out of here. So how long is up to you, but um, they don't have to, they should not be any longer than they need to be. So make them concise. Here's the opening or closing meeting checklist. Closing meeting sign-in sheet, same rules as before, um, but it's a different form for the FDA. Uh, it's a form 43, but what we do is we just have that table and we say present, 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 or if the new person's present, we'll add a row for the new person, say they weren't there for the opening, but they are there for the closing. So things that you can do. Um, team members should take notes. Did it start on time? Who was in attendance? Um, Thank the auditees for their cooperation in supporting the remote audit. And in particular, if they, people went out of their way to make it work and found workarounds, uh, make a note of that, put it in your notes for next time too, but also make a note and, and tell management, hey, th this person went out of their way. They, they loaned their phone to us so we could get this done. They, they brought in something from home to make this work. They, they used a new app that they haven't used before. Um, or if you learned to use, and somebody said just, hey, let's try this app instead because Zoom isn't working, mention that stuff because it's really nice to appreciate what, um, make a note and appreciate what people did help make this work. You wanna confirm whether your audit objectives were met, whether the scope was completed as planned, and whether you covered all the clauses of the standard or criteria, or if one was missed. Remind them, once again, audits are just a sampling. Um, the FDA is actually going to expect you to go back two years. Um, so if they find a nonconformity, they write you up with a 43, they may only mention that one item, but you're expected as part of your investigation of root cause to go back and look at records for the last two years. So that's something that you have to do. Confidentiality, um, you wanna discuss who should I send the report to? Ideally, I like to only send the report to one person and let them disseminate it. That way I can't get in trouble for disseminating it to somebody I wasn't supposed to. So that's my strategy. But if they say, could you please send it to this person? Okay, I'll do that. And I usually try to set up the email ahead of time as a draft. And then all I have to do is attach the audit report. So I make sure, I might even do a test message. Did you get it? Okay, so now I have your email. I have the test message. I just hit reply all, attach the report, done. So that's something we do. Um, certification bodies state that the report shall be shared in its entirety. So um, when I was working for BSI, we had a clause that we had to say in every audit, you can share this report, but please share it, share it in its entirety. Don't take out the section that said all the really good things and show it to people. Uh, show the whole report, not just part of it. And then um, review of nonconformities. Um, when we're reviewing the nonconformities, we're not just reviewing nonconformities. You don't want to have the outcome of the last four days of work to be, here's all the bad things that we saw. Um, one of the things that I learned early on when I was taking notes as a notified body auditor is I needed to make a conscious effort of writing down the good things that I saw. So one of the first things I wrote in our audit report this week was one of the good things we saw at this client, something that was better than previous years. So write down the strengths and make a note of those right up front. In Toastmasters, we have this sandwich approach sometimes we use, like something good, something constructive, criticism to help them improve their speaking, and then a closing solid uh, compliment for them. So sort of good, needs improvement, good. That's a really good strategy for audit closing meetings too. You know, start with strengths, 
then talk about the nonconformities, and then at the end, talk about something else that was a, a really positive thing that you were impressed by or something you learned that you're going to use again or something you're looking forward to next year. So try that sandwich approach. Um, but you want to cover your major nonconformities. Um, you want to cover your minor nonconformities after that. And usually the third thing I cover is the OFIs or observations. And if you're doing first and second party audits, you're allowed to consult and give advice. If you're a third party auditor, you're not. But as a third party auditor, when I work for BSI, one of the things I could do is I could make people aware of guidance documents. Couldn't provide advice, but I could say, you know, you might set check in section, whatever it was in this guidance document, it might have the answer you're looking for you that I can't give you because we're not allowed to consult. So um, it's a, and I actually did that with an observer present once and the observer <laughs> gave me a wink. He's like, yeah, that was the right way to do it because you're allowed to talk about a guidance document. You just can't give advice. So you answer the question, help them out, but you did it in a way that was appropriate. Corrective action. So, um, Particularly in internal audits, a lot of companies will say they want the auditor to review the corrective action plans to make sure they are, they're adequate. If you get an FDA 43, you submit the plan to the FDA for each of the 43s. So that's something you might want to include in your closing meeting is discussion of who will initiate the CAPAs to make sure they're being assigned investigations, who's going to perform the root cause analysis, who will write the CAPA plan, what time frame time frame they have for when it needs to be provided by. And um, one, of the, one of the things that's covered, particularly in third-party audits, is what is the format and content for submission of those plans? So what form you should use. If it's a supplier audit, you might actually give them your CAPA form and say, please fill out our form. Maybe electronically you give it to them. And last but not least, um, you want to make sure that, that when you're discussing these, um, you know, I, I, as an auditor, like to say, I recommend this as an effectiveness check. A lot of companies struggle with doing effectiveness checks well. A lot of times they're just verifying that it was implemented rather than it was actually effective. So you might want to actually discuss effectiveness checks for each of the nonconformities before you leave, if you can do that. Oh, that was my next slide. So <laughs> I just mentioned that part. Um, who should verify it? So if you're doing a third party audit, the company that has the nonconformity must verify the nonconformities themselves. The auditor will also do it, but you have to do it first. Um, so when they come in, they should, you shouldn't be expecting them to verify it. You should have already verified and enclosed the Kappa, and then they're going to do their own verification separately. So now we get into audity questions and um, we're at 12.53. So uh, right around the time frame that I wanted to finish. Um, we have more time on our calendar if people have a lot of questions beyond what I have here. But the questions that I'm putting down are ones um, that were asked by the people that actually um, signed up for this. They said, hey, this is the most important thing to me. And a lot of these questions are not specific to opening and closing, closing meetings. Um, so, um, oh, it looks like it. Maybe I have a slide out of order here. This was recommendations. Um, so third party auditors may not consult. First, first and second party auditors should consult. Auditors should be aware of a guidance document. So I talked about this earlier, but where's my questions? Oh, I, I realized what I'm doing here. I thought I was to the actual Q and A part of the session and I'm not there yet. Sorry. Uh, Okay, so future audits. When when is the future audit going to be? So that's one of the things that we always did is a is a both first, second, and third party audits. When is the next time we're going to have an audit? Put that right in the audit notes as a or audit report as a recommendation, like when the next audit should be de done, or if you think everything's great and you can skip a year for supplier audits. Um, who's going to do that audit? You don't usually want the same auditor year after year, so a lot of times. Uh, Medical Device Academy will assign a different auditor to come back the next year, and that way that person can also audit internal auditing. Um, and then um, where will the audit be conducted? So you might have different sites, you might rotate the sites. And do we recommend that next year be done remotely, or do we recommend that it go be on site or at least partial on site next year? Because there might have been areas we couldn't look at this year. So that's an important question about remote auditing. So should it be, should we continue with remote audits at this location or no, it didn't really work well. Uh, appeals and disputes, I already covered this. Helpful resources. So you should be looking at ISO 
10, um, 19, 0, 1, 1, 2018 version. I don't know if you have one of the older versions, but this is usually included in the lead auditor course. I've also included our procedures here, and we have a new one that's coming very soon. It's a remote auditing work instruction. So if you sign up for our uh, webinars, that'll be actually um, one of the things that you can purchase um, along with that audit. It's going to actually be on a paid audit or a paid webinar. And then Q&A. So these were the actual questions that people had asked. Um, I apologize for my not realizing, realizing I was a little out of sequence. I should have realized from the, um, from the slide title. Anyway, here we go. Uh, to complete the remote audits, what are the best approaches for the length of the audit? Um, what are the best what are the best approaches for the length of the audit meetings? So maximum attention span is 90 minutes. 30 minutes is the minimum for any process area. I've never been able to do a good job in, in less than 30 minutes. Um, I can put stuff in a report, but it's not a really good audit. Uh, breaks are necessary for productivity and your own health. Uh, scheduling four 90 minute sessions worked really well for this week, uh, us this week. I really thought that went well, but there's no reason why we couldn't have split up this morning session into two 45 minute sessions. That might have worked better. And potentially, if you're looking at a bunch of small areas, you could look at, you could do eight times 45. Um, there might have been some sessions that should have been an hour instead of an hour and a half. There might be some that could even be down to 45. So you could potentially uh, get away with less time uh, if you schedule different lengths than everything being 90 minutes. So think about it. Next question was, do you have any tips on how to conduct efficient desktop audits and possible samples? So I'm not 100% sure I got what they were, this person was asking about samples, but desktop audits are not the equivalent of on-site audits. You, you need to you only look at documents and records they email to you when you do a desktop audit. An audit is really, you're talking to the person, you're interviewing them, you're asking them. And I like to use this phrase, so everybody knows the saying of a picture is worth a thousand words. So if I show you a picture, that's giving you a thousand words of information that I didn't have to read. But if I give you a video of the production floor, that's like a thousand pictures. So that's a million words that I didn't have to read. So there's no way that I could read a million words in a half an hour, but you can show me a short video with a thousand pictures, no problem. So you really need to use video to make an audit be effective. It's, it's absolutely critical to be using some form of video to make it work correctly. Um, are there any free web uh, conference services that allow more than a 40 minute meeting at once? So. Um, Zoom is not the only company that offers free basic meetings limited to 40 minutes. There are other companies that have a 40 minute limit. I was looking at a conference service. It's actually a calling service called Uber Conference. Um, and they had a, a limitation on time as well. Um, there's pricing plans out there, but go to meeting. It says right on their website, take as much time as you need to get the job done. Your meetings will never time out. Uh, there's another service out there that had like five hours uh, of continuous. So depending on the plan, you get different time limits. But our Zoom sessions are never limited because we're not on the free plan. We have a more advanced plan. Um, and I think that you, if you're going to be doing remote audits or you're a consultant, you're crazy not to have um, something that's more than the free version of Zoom. Unless Zoom isn't your primary package. You want some other package is your primary. So I'm just showing two companies here. This is not an endorsement of Zoom or GoToMeeting, but these are the two that we have used for our business for recording webinars. So we used to use GoToMeeting, now we use Zoom. Um, we, the two are more equal than they now than they were in the past, but the pricing plans are not the same. So here are the pricing plans and the links for the pricing so you can look at them. Uh, but be careful when you go ahead and purchase them that you've got the right number of people that they're, you're buying plans for. Um, I accidentally made a mistake. I was going to do a demo of GoToMeeting to see what's new since um, several years ago when I was using it. And um, I accidentally um, somehow got an eight-person plan and got a bill for $1,600. So um, don't do that. Um, I was able to get it canceled uh, without a problem, um, but they charged me for an entire year up front. So don't do that. Um, this is actually a website I found where they were evaluating different um, different 
video conference call meeting services that you could try for everybody, uh, everybody in the world right now is trying to do Zoom meetings to go to school or talk to people to get the job done. And so this is the rank ordering from the highest score, which happened to be Zoom, to the lowest score, the life-size video conferences that I've never heard of before. But I have used personally Adobe Content or Adobe Connect. I liked it. Uh, I didn't see any problems with it. Um, I've used GoToMeeting. We used to use that before we switched over to Zoom. I've used Skype. Skype has gotten better, but I still have had some issues with the quality of the call. Um, but uh, in general, Skype does the job. I think the Skype business is preferable if you're going to use it for these purposes, but Skype is something people use. And I find a lot of people in Europe and China prefer that. Uh, Join Me, I think is actually owned by one of the other companies, maybe go to a meeting. I'm not 100% sure, but I think Join Me is, is owned by one of them, but that's a separate service and a little bit lower cost uh, version. WebEx meetings, I've always had problems with connecting. Once it was on, not a problem, but WebEx, I've always had problems connecting. It's not as easy to connect as Zoom is, um, but Zoom has also had issues with um, with um, Zoom bombing of, of their meetings, uh, so they've had to encrypt things a little bit better and, and add some um, security issues. Um, so there's been some patches, and that's one of the things that um, WebEx does really well is keeps people out, but um, it also is harder to get in. Microsoft Teams, I really like a lot. Uh, we we use that with AMI. I thought that did a really nice job. Uh, so that's definitely one I would look at if I were you. Uh, Google Hangouts Meeting. It used to be Google Hangouts, then it was Google Hangouts Meeting, and now it's Google Meeting. So they're kind of rebranding and trying to go head to head with Zoom and go to Meeting, and um, and WebEx. Um, I think they're doing an excellent job. I think that Google Meeting is superior and there, there's some third-party plugins that you can get now that allow you to do the panel view that you can do in Zoom and go to Meeting. So I would definitely look at that as an option and it's also um, free for most people to do Google Meeting. And um, the integration now with the Google Calendar is fantastic. So definitely something to think about. Uh, Uber Conference is more of a teleconference uh, solution. So I think it's fantastic for one-on-one, -on -one, but maybe not the best solution for uh, opening meetings and sharing video. And you can't record video, which is why we don't use it for our um, webinars. Uh, Blue Jeans, I looked at that. There was actually, there's a lot of head-to-head -head videos, Zoom versus this, Zoom versus that. Zoom versus Blue Jeans, I actually looked at the video of it. It looks like um, there's a little bit more lag time, uh, just a little bit in the screen, a little bit darker on the video. But, you know, for comparison to some of the solutions, BlueJeans was really solid. So they're definitely knocking, they're knocking off Zoom as a, as a copycat. And um, I thought it, it did a pretty decent job. And it, it has some different features. So you might look at that as well. But um, Zoom had, I think, the most number of votes. Oh, Skype had more votes. But Zoom had the second most votes and the highest score. So, and that's the one we're using. So if you have complaints about Zoom, uh, let us know because I don't mind switching over to another one for a session or doing some private calls on Uber Conference. What are the best conference systems to allow an eight hour web meeting connection? So this is something I mentioned earlier. I don't recommend eight hour meetings, first of all. So that's number one. It's not good for your health, not productive as shorter meetings because your energy cannot be maintain, maintained for eight hours straight. The recording files are too large. So with Zoom, not all the systems do this, but with Zoom, they save the file and then it has to be compiled. And that compiling takes a while. That's part of the reason why the quality of the recordings is good, but that's also why it takes so long. And if you're doing all day meetings, I, the uh, Google Meetings option or Google Hangouts meeting, depending on what you're used to as a brand name, that service actually goes right into Google Drive right away. And so there isn't that compiling step. So you can do back-to-back -back recordings for all day long and don't have that interruption in between. So that's something to seriously look at. Um, if you're gonna do a lot of back-to-back -back recordings all day long, Google Meetings might be a really good solution for you. And everything goes into Google Drive, which um, my video programmer actually prefers. Um, and then uh, last but not least, could be used if you intend to use breakout sessions for each auditor on a team. So. One of the things I thought about here is you could have an opening meeting with everybody, and then you could do breakout sessions for all the different processes. 
and then regroup in the closing meeting. And you could do a whole audit in one day. Um, so that might be a reason to have eight hour um, control of it. And GoToMeeting will do that, Zoom will do that. Um, and they both have breakout sessions. So does Microsoft Teams. So you, you have the ability to do these breakout sessions. Um, also they have it in Google Hangouts um, or Google Meetings. So all of those can do breakout sessions and then go back. Uh, I think there was also one for BlueJeans. So I think all of them are offering this breakout session functionality. Um, I'm not an expert in all of them, and I haven't tested them all. Uh, hang out, the separate breakout meetings is not something I've done a lot of, but we're going to be doing that in the course I'm teaching remotely next week. And that's when it's going to be eight hours of sitting. So I'm going to have to figure out something to walk around a little bit. But um, all week, we're going to be teaching a four-day course on three days on 510K and one day on Genovo. It's still open if you want to uh, log in. Um, you have to pay for the registration, but it's hosted by AAMI. So that might be something you're interested in. Thoughts on industry best practices when performing international remote audits. So um, there are a lot of very large companies that are doing audits in, in Southeast Asia remotely, um, and they have the systems that they're using. Um, I've seen Skype used a lot. I don't recommend eight hours of Skype all day. I think the way that we have been doing things is ideal with shorter duration and multiple days. And I think because you've got a 12 hour time difference with Southeast, Southeast Asia and the US that I would highly recommend doing like an hour at these off hours. So um, the audit team may not be available during the day and you could audit them in their evening or early morning and same thing for you. It could be their daytime and it could be your evening or early morning. So I think these shorter sessions, multiple days, um, but like an hour and a half at a time, is a great way to do it. that. Um, remote auditing will save you money. It's gonna save you time because you don't have the 18 hour or 14 hour red eye flight to Korea. Um, that, that's really gonna save you time. It's going to save you money, but the language barriers are gonna be a little bit more challenging because you don't have the nonverbal communication. So it's really important to have something like we do here where you have the video camera in front of you and they can see you speaking and they can, you, you wanna use the, the cell phone and the selfie sticks to share video and show people around, but you're gonna lose something in the communication. So um, it would be best to do it with companies that have a great interpreter or speak English well. And I, I think the audit that I, the mock FDA inspection I did in, in Korea, if they wanted me to come back and do an audit remotely, I think I could do that. But my first time there, um, meeting them, learning the culture, learning the company, knowing the layout of the company, I'm glad I was there in person. I wouldn't have done as good a job of that mock FDA inspection remotely. Um, but now that I've been there, I think I could do a very good job of a, of a remote audit, either internal or supplier audit. So something to think about. Uh, but international travel is really expensive. Okay, as a consultant, how do, how do you solve the most critical issues facing the medical device companies, such as EU regulations, post-market surveillance, complaint handling, et cetera? So, here are my four things that I recommend. Number one, create a quality plan. So companies, I've had some companies say, oh, here's my quality manual, that's my quality plan. That's not really a quality plan. Somebody at the FDA has said that's good enough, but that's not really a quality plan. You have two types of quality plans. One, for implementing changes or a quality system in general from the beginning. But anytime you make a change, like we're gonna add Brazil, that would be a quality plan. What things need to change in our quality system to add Brazil? What needs to change in manufacturing? What, what training is needed? What registrations are required? What auditing is required? Do we need a new certification body? What do you need for Brazil? So come up with a quality plan for it. That's number one. Number two, purchase draft standards and pre-orders. So as these new regulations come out, like ISO 14971 came out, when you have a new standard created, um, you want to purchase those as drafts ahead of time. You want to pre-order guidance documents like I've been doing for AAMI. You want to get those ahead of time, review them, and prepare for the changes, not wait until the auditor gave you a nonconformity, and then learn about it. I personally, I'm a consultant. I write blogs based on the drafts. So that's something that we do. Um, and the question was, what do we do as a consultant? But if you're a quality manager, what could you do? You could offer training saying to people, hey, this is coming. This is what the draft says. These are the things we're going to need to prepare. It's not final yet, but it doesn't, these 
procedures don't change themselves overnight. So give people warning, do an internal training, make people aware of it. Don't leave that just for the manager reviews. It should be a separate discussion offline or in a meeting uh, where you're talking about this is what changes are coming and prepare for it. Um, and then the third one is create webinars based upon drafts. So that's what we do. And I, every single one of these blue uh, links that I provided on the screen, you have the native slide deck. There are actually hyperlinks there. You can go to pages that are examples of where we've actually done that. And we sell those products. So that's what we do as a consultant. But what should you do if you're a quality manager in your company? Do a training video. Practice Zoom. Become really good at using Zoom and record webinars. And so when you have a new employee, hey, watch this webinar, watch this webinar, watch this webinar, read these procedures, look at this standard. That's how you do training. Standardize your training requirements for that job. Here's a, some few future webinars. So I haven't created a, an actual web page for the fourth one yet. That's going to be coming soon, but the other three are already there. You can schedule them or register for them and attend them. The next one is free. That's on audit team communication during a remote audit. And it's going to talk a lot more about um, the things that we alluded to today, but we're gonna actually get more in depth in some of the tools and what works, what doesn't, maybe do a little demo. And then um, the, um, and we'll talk more about the audit report. That's gonna be a major focus of that is getting into the audit report and how to share things in the audit report. So we'll do that. And then the other two are paid webinars. We're upgrading old webinars that we did. We're gonna redo them all. So between now and June 1st, you can pre-order the first one and get it at 199 or 129, I actually think. Um, and then it will upgrade, the price will go up. And then the remote auditing one, that also you can pre-order until July 1st, and then that will get upped in price as well. So those are two, and you're getting different new content. Like one of them comes with our brand new work instruction, and the other one comes up with comes uh, with something else. I can't remember what it is right now. Oh, it's, it's probably a supplier, um, a supplier survey for, um, so the supplier webinar is coming with a new supplier survey for assessing the potential of doing remote audits of your suppliers. Can they support a remote audit? Do they have the facilities and, and appropriate um, technology in place to do that? So that's something that I'm gonna give you as a supplier questionnaire. Um, and then the last one, we're going to be interviewing some NBSAP auditing organizations. So we're going to be sharing that. And um, that hasn't been scheduled yet because we haven't gathered all the feedback yet. Oh, and one last thing. If you're interested in being a beta reader, I know at least one of the people on, the, on today's call have uh, agreed to be a beta reader. If you click on that link, um, the original link I sent out did not have book in front of it. So this new one says book in front of it. Um, but you can actually go and see our um, our graphic for our um, new book. Uh, Matthew and I are writing this, and this should be ready uh, for beta readers in July and the final one on Amazon sometime in August. Uh, the pre-order of the book, I think, is going to be the end of August, but it'll probably be ready a little early. So um, let me know if you have any questions or suggestions for content in our book. Um, we'd love to get feedback on uh, this webinar or questions you have. Um, if you have any questions, please type into the chat box. Um, but I think I've answered all the questions that people gave me ahead of time. And I don't see any questions in here from people that are attending this webinar right now in my emails. Uh, let's see who we've got left. So we got uh, Matthew still here, Mary's still here. Anybody have any questions? Or I can stop the recording and uh, you can all have an extra 15 minutes back of your life. Going? Okay. I think that's it for today. Uh, I don't have any chat questions. Uh, I hope this was helpful to you. Any feedback you have for me, just shoot me an email or give me a call. Uh, my name is on here. And oh, last slide here. So the last slide has our my contact information uh, for Skype and uh, email and uh, Google Voice number that goes also rings right to my cell phone. So any and you can also if you want to schedule a, a call with me, just use this link here. It's a 30 minute meeting. It makes sure that I have time before and after, so we're not rushing things. But um, that's a free to anybody that wants to have a call with me. 
Thank you very much and have a great day. Bye-bye.